All right, so uh, today we're going to uh, close out the series on uh, peace of mind. It is a uh, mental health series as we've been looking at some of the people in Scripture that have been dealing with some of the things like depression, anxiety. We've dealt with trauma last week. We talked about worry And today we're going to close it out talking about burnout. So here's the thing. You feel, have you ever felt like you're on the edge and you can't take anymore? Right? This is the the part of burnout. And we're going to talk about the differences here. But more than half, and this is studies that have been done, more than half of U.S. workers feel burned out as a result of their job demands. So once again, the United States reigns supreme in this area as well. We win again. (laughs) We have more of these demands that come up and more of these studies that are done that people are saying that they are burnt out. They feel like there's no end to it. So people feel overwhelmed and on the edge of burnout. And you see, burnout isn't just a, uh, the long hours, right? It's not just the, hey, I'm working and I'm working a lot. But there's something to burnout that leads us to be able to believe that there's no end. And so that's where we get to the combination, right? We have, it's a combination of lots of different things, burnout. So it talks about the mental, emotional, and the physical parts of burnout that's happening in us. Burnout reflects the inability to balance competing demands, right? So there's lots of things that are coming at us and we have a hard time being able to navigate it because burnout says, I'm done. I don't see an end. The difference between stress and burnout is that stress is usually categorized as short-term. Right? It's short-lived. It's based on a project or a time period. Right, So there's something that's happening and that you're stressed about it. Sometimes we look at this in, uh, you know, I'll put this in the pastor realm, like there's busy seasons or stressful seasons. There's lots of demands that are put on pastors at certain times of the year. Right? We look at like Christmas and Easter. Right, We know that there's going to be people, lots of people that are going to be coming that maybe haven't come or don't come on a regular basis. So there's parts of it where there's lots of things that are happening. So it's short term. It's based on a little piece or a slice of a season. What's the difference then between burnout? Burnout is chronic stress that feels never-ending, there's no relief, and there's no fight left, right? So burnout says, like, it's not just a stressful season, it's actually I'm burnt out, and there is no end. All of this in me has come to, like, this, like, almost as we see it as as a pit. And it's not just the pit of depression, But it's saying like the constant stress, not just a season, but a constant stress of things day after day after day after day, and there's no end. It leaves people feeling hopeless. So we're going to look at the uh, prophet Elijah. Laura just read uh, a portion of Elijah's story. Um, from 1 Kings. So if you got your Bibles, you want to open them up. 1 Kings chapter 19 is where um, we're going to spend a majority of time. We got a couple of other, like actually only one other place. So we're going to be mostly in 19. But what I need to do for you here this morning is kind of give you this, this bigger snapshot of the Elijah story Without us being able to just go into scripture, I'm going to give you kind of like the synopsis of the story so that you can understand it and see what God's trying to do in the life of Elijah and what led Elijah to also understand a moment and times where he was burnt out. 
So the prophet Elijah is one of like the, you know, like he's, he sits almost as the pinnacle of the, one of the highest prophets in the Old Testament. People look at Elijah. Elijah shows up at the transfiguration to represent kind of like that prophet status, right? You get Moses and Elijah. Why? Because these two are very well known in the Old Testament and they stood as key characters. So when we're looking at Elijah, and we also do not put Moses or Elijah on a pedestal, right? I always talk about this. Why? Because we're highlighting them, and we're going to highlight some good things. But here's the thing. Moses and Elijah are not perfect. We already know that. But Elijah, as a prophet of God, is close to God. He listens. When God speaks, Elijah's listening Right, and so as that prophet of God, he's got an, you know, a task to be able to put before him. He's going to bring people the word of God. Now with that, as he's bringing people the word of God, he's going to confront evil and also highlight the good. In particular, in Elijah's day, there was evil that needed to be confronted. King Ahab. Now, King Ahab, we're just going to do a quick King Ahab. He's like trying to find the ways and being the most wicked, right? He looks at the other kings of the past and says, hey, these guys were bad. I'm going to be worse. And you look at it and you say, how can they get worse, right? We even find out of the divided kingdom that we see these kings. And there's right after Solomon when the kingdom split. From a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom, it was even after that, Solomon's son, who took the throne after him, said, you know what, I'm going to get this advice. How should I run the, the nation? And he's like, well, Solomon, he was, he was strict in some ways. And he, en he en enacted some taxes upon the people. And he got some words from some Solomon's advisors that kind of carried over. And they said, you know what, you should go light on the people. Right? Let them have some breathing room. But this king, he came through and he's like, had some of his advisors that he brought in. I kind of look at it as kind of like his frat brothers. His frat brothers come to him and are like, no, this is the opportunity to drop the fist, bring the pain, show them that you are greater than your father. By bringing this judgment upon them. So that was already the start of a long line of really bad kings. And Ahab tries to be able to show them up. Ahab has taken on the, uh, the persona of every culture, every tribe, and he's tried to be able to say, there's no room for the God of Israel here. We're just going to do things and we're going to take over the world. He doesn't actually take over the world. He actually doesn't do very well in much of his rule. But Elijah is there to be able to speak truth to power. He knows the position that he's putting himself in when he's speaking truth to power. That the king's not going to like it. There happens in the land about it. There's a three-year drought that's going on. Elijah has told the king that the drought's going to happen because of the wickedness of the land. And he's saying, king, do something about it. Turn away from this and turn back to God. And he doubles down and he goes against the prophet Elijah. And he says, I am going to hunt you now, Elijah, because you're trying to speak these words of truth that you say is truth to me. I'm the king. I get to say. So he's now a hunted man. He's finding these places as he's running from the king's soldiers. Kind of reminds me of like David in the Psalms when he's been running from Saul and his whole tribe, right? All of these people coming after. Elijah's doing the same. And there's moments in this hunt that he's, he's like, God, I can't take anymore. 
Like these people are trying to hunt me, and I don't want to have to fight this battle. Why? Why can't you just make it easier? It's in this moment that God, in the midst of a drought, provides for Elijah. And so he finds bread and meat that are actually prepared by ravens, right? The ravens come and provide the meat, the bread, the water that sustains Elijah's life. It's during this time also that Elijah runs into a widow who it's her and her son in the household. Elijah moves in and he says, hey, make me something to eat. And she says, well, I've only got enough for one more meal and I can't waste it on you. I have to be able to provide for my son because my son's going to die. And Elijah says, well, do it anyways. The son dies. And he says, but wait, it's not the end of the story for your son. God comes in, raises the dead through Elijah. It's kind of an amazing moment where he's pretty low. It won't be his lowest, just so you know. We're going to get to that here in a little bit. Not his lowest, but he feels like it's his lowest. He's like, almost like, this was my rock bottom, God. And God's like, no, I'm going to show you what your rock bottom is here in a second. But wait a second, I'm going to show you that I can sustain you. I can provide for you. So that you can't walk away and say that I wasn't there for you. God shows him the work that God can only do by raising the dead. And he's like, all right, this is pretty cool, right? So Elijah has this moment where he sees God hand, God's hand powerfully at work with providing and raising the dead. So then we get to, I would say, the pinnacle of Elijah's ministry is that he's now bold, he calls all of Baal's prophets, and he says, hey, let's head to the mountain for a showdown. So you get 850 Baal prophets, and you have Elijah as the only one who's standing there for Yahweh, the God of Israel. And he goes through this process of being able to say, hey, let's have this sacrifice together. And you are going to take your altar and you're going to put it up there before Baal. And you're going to call down fire from heaven until the sacrifice is consumed. So the Baal prophets all gather around. They're doing all of their hocus pocus. They're trying to cause magic to occur by causing this sacrifice to be consumed. And they wait days, waiting for Baal to come. And Elijah says this, he says, Baal must have stepped away. And actually in the Hebrew, it, it really means that Baal had to use the restroom, must have gone somewhere, right? I mean, he was kind of joking about Baal, right? He's, he's causing them to be able to say, hey, you know what, Baal probably had a restroom break. Don't worry, we can wait still if you'd like. A little sarcastic, it's fun. And then Elijah takes his turn when they finally give up. And he says, hey, here's the thing. He said, I don't want you to just uh, think that this is by accident. He said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to take water, and I want you to douse the whole thing, right? Put a, create a moat around it, and put water all around this sacrifice, because I want you to be able to see what God can do. So they soaked the whole sacrifice. Elijah steps before God, and he says, consume the sacrifice, and fire from heaven falls consumes the sacrifice. Elijah calls for the death of the 850 Baal prophets, and the people are now on Elijah's side. You see, this is the reason why it's a pinnacle, because Elijah was standing alone. 
Nobody was standing for Elijah. Nobody was speaking for Elijah. No one was there to be able to help Elijah at his, what he thought was his lowest. Nobody. And now these people stand with him. But you see the part about being the pinnacle is that there's also a fall. Because what happens when Jezebel, which is the queen, Ahab's, right? Ahab's wife, the queen. And Jezebel is not a follower of Yahweh. And so she is upset, angry, mad, and she calls for the death of Elijah. She says, the sun will not fall before Elijah is dead. So guess what happens to Elijah now? He's back on the run. He's back thinking, oh great, here's the other cycle. Here's something now that we see God, like I, he's not going to back me. He doubts it, and here's another thing that hits him again. And this is where we get to the passage that we read in Scripture. So if you got 1 Kings chapter 19, 3 and 5, Elijah was afraid, and he fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I've had enough. Take my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors who have already died. Then he laid down and slept under the broom tree. This is Elijah's lowest. And it's so strange because it comes right after his pinnacle. People were behind him. People weren't actually actively rebelling against him. They were standing with him and for him, and they were standing together for Yahweh. And now he's hunted again. You see, the body responds. And we talked about this in burnout um, before, and I gave you kind of the, the breakdown, but the body is going to respond, and how does it, it, there's physical ways that it responds. It means you get easily fatigued when you're burnt out, that you're tired, you're exhausted, you have a difficult time sleeping. These are the parts where you start waking up in the middle of the night because you can't sleep. You start to be able to take on unhealthy relationships to food, alcohol, and drugs. Because you're burnt out and you're saying there's got to be a solution here in these chemicals. There must be a solution to be able to help me get out of this because I am tired, I'm worn out, I'm beat up. I've got nothing left in the tank. Drugs, alcohol... Help me. You see, then we turn to, in a very physical manner, to be able to say, change my body chemistry with these chemicals that are on the outside. We're looking for a very physical change, and yet the physical change doesn't get helped by any of these unhealthy relationships. We see the physical, we see mental. The ongoing stress impacts the brain. And this is where science is going to come in. Psychology comes in. Because what happens to our brains when there's a constant attack, a constant stress, like burnout, it enlarges the amygdala. Now, the amygdala is the part of the brain that has the fight or flight, right? So in your fight or flight, you're also in this. If it's been impacted for so long, you're trying to figure out where to fight and where to flight. 
You're always in this kind of constant process of being able to say, where is it that I should fight? And then you start to be able to just say, I'm going to give up. It also weakens the prefrontal prefrontal cortex, which is your decisive part of your brain. It's the part of the brain that makes decisions. And guess what? When you are under attack constantly and you are burnt out, you start to be able to say, I can't make any decisions. I can't even think about what's straight and what's not. So how is it that I can actually make it a decisive choice on where to go, what to do, on a plan that God might have? And then it deals with the emotional side too. You have feelings of self-doubt. You get cynical, you get bitter, and you get disconnected. And this disconnection doesn't just happen with our relationship with others. It also becomes our relationship with God. Because there it is when we start to be able to view God in a very unhealthy way. We start to be able to say, I'm so burnt out, and God, you have done nothing, right? This is where our burnout brings us. This is where it starts to be able to affect our very emotions because we're saying, I don't deserve right, any of this, the possible good things that God might have. And then it leads you to that cynical section, Where everything in the world is bad. So it plays on our physical, our mental, and our emotional. We see it in Elijah's life right there. Because he gets to a place physically where he's saying, I don't want to go on. I'm going to lay under this tree until I die. You see, there's the part where you just give up because there's nothing else you can do. So how did we get to this place? How did we get to a spot where we feel so burnt out that we're just saying, I give up? Number one, what we do is we run ourselves into the ground. So there's lots of things that get put before us. And there's a way in which we as people should be able to navigate the things that get put before us. But there are so many things that get put before us that we start to be able to say, no, I can do that. Oh, something else. Yeah, I can handle this. I can do that too. I can be that. I can do this, and you start to take everything on, and you're just like, oh yeah, like I've got plenty of time, and I've got plenty of energy, until you don't. 1 Kings 19, verse 3, let's highlight this again. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life, and he went to Beersheba, a town in Judah. And he left his servant there, right? So he's saying at this point in time, like he has tried to do a lot. He's trying to be a representative for Yahweh. He's trying to be able to speak truth into power. He's trying to be able to challenge these Baal prophets. He's trying to do, do, do. And he's like, here's another task. I'm going to do this. And he gets to the point where he says... I'm afraid. I don't know what to do. There is no path outside of this for him. The second one, we always try to do things on our own. So Elijah, as you can also see in that verse 3, is that he says, he says, servant, you don't need to come with me I'm going to take care of this. Now, he didn't tell his servant what his plan was. He didn't say, hey, servant, you're now free to go do your thing because I'm going to lay under a tree until I die. But he's like, I don't need you. 
Have you tried to be able to do things on your own, trying to be able to handle your physical, your emotional, your mental well-being without trying to be able to take into account anybody else in your life? This is not good. It's not a good strategy. When we talk about depression and anxiety. We talk about the mental conditions, the things that are happening within our body. And if we try to be able to say, I can navigate this in my, on my own and I don't need anybody, it means that we're going to cycle ourselves in the midst of trauma, in the midst of depression, and we're the only voice that we're listening to or hearing is our own negative voice. It's the same words that we're feeding ourselves, saying, I'm not good. I don't know what I'm doing. I haven't got a plan. I've got nothing left in the tank. And you're listening to yourself. I've tried to do it. I tried to do it on my own. And it doesn't work. So then it leads us into dwelling on the negative. Chapter, or verse 4 there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat underneath the broom tree and prayed that he might die. I've had enough. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Right? Who's going to tell him any differently? Who's going to speak into Elijah's life now that he's separated himself from community? Who's going to tell him, hey, Elijah, you've done some things that God has given to you, and you've been able to work that to the best of your ability. Hey, you're needed. Nobody's there. He has his feelings, thoughts, and emotions, his physical well-being, and he's saying, I'm done. When we dwell on the negative... It becomes the cycle of negative, the cycle of denial, the cycle of doubt, the cycle of worry, stress, burnout. These are the things that start to erode us. So when you start, and in, in even in understanding that this, uh, this burnout might be setting in, you still say, oh, no, like, it's fine. It, you know, like, it's just, it's just the beginning, even though it's not. Right? We see it, and we even recognize sometimes that we're feeling burnt out, and we're still saying, like, nope, it's still not that bad. And then we get stuck in the cycles. We get stuck in the negative habits that just continue to erode us. It's not good. So here's the other side of the story in 1 Kings uh, 19.5. Right? So it says, Then he laid down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping... An angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. Right? The angel comes. Sometimes anytime anybody looks in the Old Testament, they find an angel that comes. They always talk about this being a pre-incarnate Jesus. Now you can talk about it in that way or you can just say, hey, it's an angel, right? So it's before Jesus stepped into human flesh, he was still with God and was working with God because he was God. Right? There wasn't a time that Jesus wasn't. And so when you're looking at this, this could be Jesus coming near to Elijah and saying, Hey, Elijah, it's time for you to get up and eat. It wasn't this angel that came and said, Elijah, you're being ridiculous. It wasn't like, Elijah, hey, guess what? Like, you need to figure out a different plan. Let's map it out together. No, he didn't say that. He just said, hey, it's time to get up and eat. Sometimes the most spiritual thing that you can do in your life, especially when you are feeling burnout, is rest. Stop. Cut it out. It's time to rest. 
You see, your body reacts, and your body's trying to be able to tell you, like, it's high, like I want to shut down, I want to shut down. And you're like, no, you can't shut down. You can't do it, because things won't get done then. This life has got to be lived. You've got to be able to do it. And your body's like, I'm trying, I'm trying. Can't do it. That's why when you're looking at the spiritual aspect and saying, Jesus tells us in the, in the New Testament about rest as well, and it's not something that's changed. The spiritual things that we can do, sometimes we've got to say, I've got to stop. I need to rest. I've got to be able to find a break from the physical, the mental, and emotional Havoc that's happening in my body. So maybe some of you right now need rest. And it's a call for that. It's time to be able to say, I've got to figure out a way to give my mind, my body, my emotions rest. But sometimes we also need a little bit more, right? So I'm, we don't just navigate this path and say, Elijah took a rest, and so therefore, today I'm going to take a nap. You're like, all right, maybe a nap is called for and in good order for you today, and it might be. I have a hard time napping because I don't like to rest. <laughs> but <laughs> this isn't about me. This is about you. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But sometimes you might need a little bit more than that. So what are the things you might need? You might need a counselor. You might need somebody to be able to help navigate the journey in your head and in your heart and in your life. Don't be afraid to go to somebody. Now a counselor, here's the good thing. what The counselor is kind of like this third party that is not actively engaged in your life on a daily basis. Counselors do not then sit and judge you based on every action or thought that you might have. See, the counselor is there to ask questions, to engage in different parts of your mind, right? And to say, what does this mean for you? So it's safe. And that's the reason why we have to find ways and looking at whether it's a counselor, whether it's somebody in that third party that kind of sits outside of your whole body and self, right? Or there's also ways in which you should be trying to engage your mind and engage your body. How can you engage your mind and engage your body differently than you currently have been? So there's lots of different ways you can engage your mind. Take the time to be able to read. Or you're like, hey, I don't really like reading. Well, guess what? There's this awesome thing called audiobooks that you just listen to a book then. Or if you're like me, I like to listen to podcasts. I like to listen to people talk about lots of different areas, whether it's the spiritual, whether it's the mental. And I like to be able to see how they engage in the life and the world around them through these things. You see, there's ways in which you engage your mind. But this, it doesn't mean it's the end. It's like, hey, I listened to a podcast, therefore I'm rested, everything's good, I'm not burnt out anymore. Nope. It's just a change. Because remember, if it's the constant burnout that's going on, and you're like... I'm going to do the same path? You're like, but that's not going to engage your mind differently. So what's ways in which you need to engage your body differently? You know, we look at here, exercise. You see, exercise is good for your body. It's good for your brain. It's good for your heart. And you're like, wait a second, I don't, I don't like working out. I don't know, I mean, there's, there's not a lot of people that I think, especially if they go from zero, right? I, I work out zero times, and I've worked out zero times for my entire life. And you're like, and now I love it, right? You're like, maybe, but there's a lot that happens in between there. There's a lot of things that you're like, I do not like to run. I do not like to get my heart rate up to 170, 
It's not fun. You see, there's a process that you try to be able to get your body because you're going to engage it differently. You're going to start to say, this this is the part of the change that needs to happen in me. That if I gauge my mind, if I engage my body, then those different, different rhythms in your life start to be able to change the things that are happening. Then you don't feel like Elijah and saying, I'm going to lay under a tree and wait until I die. Different rhythms are needed. So we look back at 1 Kings again, 11 and 12. Jesus, or God, right, pre-incarnate Jesus, comes to him. He says, go out, stand before the mountain, the Lord said. And Elijah stood there. The Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. You see, it's the gentle whisper that you're like, wait a second, why couldn't God speak in the earthquake, in the fire? Why couldn't God speak there? Because here it is, and this is a plain and simple truth, God is in the ordinary. He's not always trying to be able to create the extraordinary, the supernatural, so that you're like, speak to me, God, and let it be an audible voice that I can hear. And you're like, waiting around like, I guess God doesn't work. Maybe it's because you weren't listening. Maybe it's because you were looking for God in some like magical thing that was going to be able to bring to you this like awe and wonder because you were looking for something supernatural when God was going to be working into the natural. Why is it that God whispers when he could have yelled and screamed? Because God's like, hey, I'm right next to you. If I yell and scream, your eardrums pop. I'm right next to you. I'm with you. I'm close by, and so I don't need to yell. I'm going to whisper. I'm going to whisper because I want you to know that I'm next to you. These are the things we need to constantly remind ourselves in the midst of and trying to be able to beat burnout. Because burnout's always going to tell us that we're alone, there's no end in sight, and that we should give up. And God's saying, I'm here. And I'm here for you. Right now. And we're going to end with Jesus. Because we've already talked about Jesus. But we might as well also go to the incarnate Christ in Matthew chapter 11. And this is a familiar verse for us, but I think it takes on um, particular meaning for us. And we start to be able to think about how this all applies. Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and carry heavy burdens. I'm going to give you rest. Eh? Rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you. Because I'm humble, gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You see Jesus, he's masterful. Because he's talking about physical rest. He's saying you've been working, and in this passage he's looking at all of these spiritual ways, like the religious terms and things that people get put on them, right? Keep working for your salvation. Keep working, right? And they're like, I'm tired and I can't do this and I'm frail and I'm broken. And Jesus is like, I know you've been beat up. Come, I'm going to give you rest. But you see, then he takes it on to a different level when he actually says not just rest for your bodies, not just rest for you trying to work, 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 and more work. He's saying, I'm going to find and give you the rest for your soul. 
Let your soul rest in Jesus. He wants you to find this way out. Not that there is this conclusion of defeat, this conclusion of no hope. But he said, I got a path, and we're going to walk it together. And that's where you'll find rest. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and pray with me.